in my very deep condolences um, on the passing of Kenrick Georges. Kenrick Georges was the person who composed our national anthem and certainly will go down in history as someone who was there at the birth of our nation and the song that we all love and we all cherish and that evokes so much in our hearts in terms of patriotism that he was the, the person who put that song together. Kenrick Georges was a musician of incredible renown and we have lost him now to the ages and I certainly would want from this rostrum to extend my condolences to his entire family and those who survive him. I also would want to extend my condolences to Police Officer Denzel Pemberton, the family of Police Officer Denzel Pemberton. Uh, he passed away quite suddenly. Uh, many of you may not have known him, but I knew him because he was often the Sergeant at Arms at the National Assembly in St. Kitts. And we were quite shocked to hear the news that he had passed away. And we thank him for his service and we certainly extend condolences to his family. From those words of condolences, let me go to a congratulatory mood and extend my heartiest congratulations and the congratulations of my government to young Yakira Elliott and Andrew Slater on their selection to the Sinkis Nevis under 14 football team. Um, they were selected and played in August. They represented the Federation, the Caribbean Federation Union Football Challenge Series. Young Yakira was one of the vice captains, and she also captained the team in one of the matches. I've known little Yakira, as I call her, for a long time. I didn't know she was a footballer. So I'm very happy that she has not only excelled, but is now playing at the regional level. Divisions Rocco Brown, Viber Stevens, Kenasi Dorset, and Theon Creeley, they have all been selected to the Sinkis Nevis under 15 national football team, and that participated in the CONCACAF under 15 championship in Tampa, Florida during the month of August, and so I extend congratulations to them as well. Mr. Carl Tuckett, a household name, former West Indies player from Nevis. Um, he also played for the Leeward Islands, of course, and he officiated as an umpire in the Canada Global T20 Tournament. We congratulated him, that occurred in July. We congratulated him then, and we congratulate him now, and we look forward, certainly, to uh, Mr. Tuckett standing in his first test match. We hope that will be soon as he moves forward. And all of these are Nivisions, some young, some not so young, but Nivisions were putting us on the world stage. And we welcome that and we congratulate them all. I would also take a moment to extend congratulations to former Commissioner of Police, Ian Creeley. Uh, as you know, he would have served in that capacity, but has now moved on and is partner of the diplomatic world, being the ambassador for the OECS to the Kingdom of Morocco, based in Rabat. And so we would want to thank him for his service as a police officer all these years and as the Commission of Police and certainly wish him well in his new role as OECS ambassador in Morocco. Let me also congratulate officers Carl Kubert England, Coretta Harris and Kashima Burke. They have recently been confirmed to the post of Sergeant in the St. Christopher Nevis Police Force. Officers England and Harris are both serving in Nevis and we thank them for their service and congratulate them on their elevation to the rank of sergeant. Let me also congratulate Mr. Carlisle Powell, Mr. Keith Atherton, and Mr. Stephen Samanas. They are all honorees of the 15th annual NEVDC Honor, Honors Banquet, which will take place on Saturday, the 28th of September in Washington, DC. Mr. Manners, we are told, will be an honoree, but also the keynote speaker. And this year's event will be held under the theme cricket for love of the game, unifying beyond the boundary. And I think that's a welcome message that we are using sport and a theme, a theme around sport to unify our people. And I think that that is in fact excellent. And I congratulate all the honorees and NEVDC for the wonderful work that they continue to do. I would like to take a moment um, to invite the general public to the various events for our independence celebrations, of course, we celebrate our 36th anniversary of independence on the 19th of September uh, 2019. And we have a number of events there, including a state service in Nevis. As we know, since the unity government took over the reins of government in 2015, we've alternated the state service. Hitherto, for all the years prior to 2015, all the events happened on St. Kitts. The new government took a position 
that the people of Nevis or no less than and should be included in national affairs of this kind. And so we have alternated the state service. And so the state service will happen in Nevis this year. And certainly you can check the calendar of events to see where and when, but I would extend an invitation to all. We also started last year this uh, new approach, a new thing that we're doing, which is to have the uh, Heroes Day concert. Last year we had two of the biggest bands in reggae music, conscious reggae music that is, uh, Steel Pulse and Third World, and I think they put on a phenomenal show at the Cultural Complex, a show that was free, and we're doing it again this year. We have this year the evangelist, I'm told, she's referred to Carleen Davis, uh, who's, as you know, world-renowned and quite famous. If memory serves, she used to be around Bob Marley and the Whalers way back when. And Carleen Davis is now an evangelist, and she sings to the praise of God, the praise and worship of God. She will be here as one of our headliners. And we also have, of course, Maxi Priest, uh, whom we all know very well, another international artist. He will be here as one of the headliners. We also have with them uh, young Vanel Powell and uh, young uh, Alison Doerr. Atherton, I'm sorry, I, she's married. I must give her her title. Atherton. Um, and both, of course, are, are very well known and locally renowned gospel singers. And so we have sought to bring again something conscious uh, for our people, to unite our people. It's being celebrated under the theme One Nevis, One Federation, One Love. And this is, again, paying homage to our national heroes. Just to remind you that we're inviting people to come. The concert is free and we're hoping that people will wear their national colors. And so bring a rag, bring a flag, put on something that represents Sinkets and Nevis, and come out and enjoy yourself. It is our effort to once again promote patriotism in our country and to bring people together. And that is why we are very clear as to the type of artists that we bring. We want people who we feel can uplift us, and that is the objective. And so we invite one and all to come out and be a part of that. That is going to happen on Sunday. September 15th at the Cultural Village, starting at 9 p.m. And the reason that we're doing it on the Sunday is because we're trying to accommodate the cricket that is going to be happening in St. Kitts. That is happening, CPL cricket, as we know. It's late this year. And I know on that very Sunday, there's a game on St. Kitts at 6 p.m. So we're hopeful that after the game, that all roads will lead to the Cultural Village in Nevis for this big concert and that the people will really come together in a show of love and unity and togetherness as we try to promote that in our country. This is a time of unprecedented peace in St. Kitts and Nevis. The crime rate has plunged, <laughs> thankfully, tremendously downwards. We are continuing to see a downward trend. I want to commend, of course, the high command, the police force, and commend our people, because ultimately crimes are committed by our people and against our people. So I want to commend our people and our communities for continuing to do the right thing. And I am hopeful and prayerful that this trend that we're seeing will continue. And what a better way to celebrate than to come together in a concert of this kind. And because of the sponsorship that we have this year from Nevis International Bank and Trust, um, they have come on as major sponsors for this concert. It has allowed us to put on this concert and to do so for free. And so there's no admission. The vendors and everybody else will be there, so we're hopeful that they too will make a dollar. The vendors, food and drinks are not for free. The concert is for free. So come out and enjoy the free music and support the vendors as well. So I am delighted to have uh, everyone there. Now I want to switch because the topic, it seems, of the, of the, um, the moment is education. And I wanted to switch very quickly and say a word about education. I want to start with an apology because it is no secret now that we have had some delays at the Charleston Secondary School and at the Ivor Walters Primary School and some disruption to parents and students and teachers at those two schools. This cabinet would have met um, some months ago and would have decided that we would, on the recommendation of the responsible minister, the Honorable Troy Leibert, we would undertake certain works at the various schools. In fact, Minister Leibard, if you know him, you know that he's a fellow who wants to do as much as he can. And so he brought a long list of work. 
And we said we could not achieve all the work, and so we cut that list down, and we thought that we had a, a, a list that was achievable. The contractors were selected. It wasn't being done by public works because we thought to expedite, we would get private contractors. They were selected and they set to work as early as we could possibly mobilize them. Many of them would have been on the job early in July, um, uh, mid-July, I'm sorry, to, in order to try and get this work done. The difficulty, however, is that perhaps being an ambitious government, we bit off more than we could chew in relation to at least two of those projects, CSS and Ivor Walters. I want the public to understand that the delays that have been experienced have been unavoidable. That it, the work that was being done was being done in a genuine effort to improve the plant, the physical infrastructure for our parents, our teachers, and our students. We have a mandate to have child-friendly schools. That is the mandate. We must have schools where the infrastructure is friendly, it's safe, it's welcoming. And we all know, and I don't think that this is, this is being political in any way, we all know that the schools have been neglected over many, many years. And I'm very proud of the record of this government in its effort to improve the plant, the physical plant, and to live up to the expectation that we have that our schools will be child friendly. And as a consequence, we have been spending, we have been investing, and we have been seeking to do the best that we can. And I want the press and the members of the public to get a sense, because over the last um, few years, we have spent a global sum from 2015 until now of $10,782,491. $10,782,491. In 2015, we spent $2.9 million. 2016, $359,000. 2017, $4.27 million. 2018, $1.5 million. And 2019, we have allocated some $1.8 million thus far. All of this is money that, your money, that the government has decided to spend on seeking to improve the schools on the island of Nevis. This year was no different, but we understand the summer is a small window, it's a narrow window of time, and so we try to do as much as we can, recognizing that sometimes there will be delays. I nevertheless apologize because I think that any inconvenience to our students and teachers is unacceptable. And I've let the minister and certainly his team know that I was unhappy that there was a delay. But at the same time, all of us were reasonably recognized that sometimes in doing construction, we encounter unexpected problems and difficulties. And so, for example, at the Ivor Walters Primary School, when the roof was taken off to deal with rodents and other infestation and some leaking and things of that rotting away, we recognized that some of the roof had a, a, a steel frame that could not be removed because it was part of the structure. That was not known before. And so when that was taken off, you realize you lost some time because you then had to manufacture some brackets in order to put the rafters in. So we had some delays such as those. But I would wish, nevertheless, to go on record to commend the contractors because a lot of them work late into the night to try their very best. And while I'm talking about Ivor Walters, let me also commend the community because a community of young ladies over there have banded together and are cleaning the school. They say they're giving it something called a deep clean. And so I would want to commend Jilly and the whole group uh, for doing the very best that they can to ensure. As they said to me, this is their school and they're making a contribution and I am grateful to them for that. But I think that the, the emphasis on the level of investment over $10 million, in fact nearly $11 million in the last four years, is indicative of the commitment that the government has had to education and the commitment that we've had to ensuring that our students and our teachers have the best possible environment within which to work. Do we always get it right? No. And I don't think anybody always gets it right. But I think our heart is in the right place and our effort is in the right place and we are moving in the right direction in relation to the schools. And I believe that our teachers and our students and their parents appreciate that effort despite the inconvenience at those two schools. Let me point out that we did work at Violet Jeffers Primary, 
We did work at St. Thomas's Primary. We did work at the, uh, what's it called, uh, the preschool at, at St. Thomas's, Ines France Preschool. We did some minimal work at the Charleston Primary School. We did massive work at the Gingerland Secondary School. All of this was done over the summer. And most of that work was done on time, and the students have had no disruption. So whilst, yes, we have had some difficulties at CSS and Ivor Walters, I would not wish for us to focus only on the difficulties there, but also to give credit for the excellent work done at the other schools as well, and to continue to commit to the public that each summer, each break time, we will continue to improve the plant. And what we're trying to do is not just a stopgap, not just to, to patch a wall, or remove a sheet of galvanized and patch a hole in the, in the um, roof. We are really trying to upgrade the plant so that we are fit for purpose for the 21st century. And that is the effort. And in that regard, I ask, of course, the support of well-meaning members of the community that this is what we're seeking to achieve for them. I believe that the investment is paying dividends because I have in front of me the results from Preliminary results, let me emphasize, from CXC and from KEEP. And those preliminary results suggest that our teachers have responded positively to the efforts. They are doing well in terms of teaching our children, and our children themselves are responding positively and are performing. I have heard it said time and time again, and some of us, it seems, in our public discussion can only criticize. In life, and I was in opposition at one point. I hope not to go back there, but I was there at some point. And in life, we understand that there will always be something to criticize. I always remind people that you have a glass that's half full of water. Some will say the glass is half empty. Some will say the glass is half full. Both are correct, but it's a question of perspective. And when you're bent on negativity, you will find something negative to say. And that has been the difficulty I feel in the public discussion in the country. Because I have heard it being said of our education system that it's failing. But the results don't support that. Again, is it perfect? No education system anywhere is perfect. Nations larger than us, with far more resources than us, have schools that are not performing. And that tells us that it's not just a function of money and resources. It's also a function of dedication and commitment from our teachers. You can sometimes have students and you provide the best environment for them. But if they don't take up the book and decide to study, what the result is likely to be. It requires all of us to raise the child and all of us to make the contribution that is necessary. To build the kind of society that we need. And there's no value, in my view, in a continued effort to bash our teachers and bash our schools and bash our education system. Because all of us, I'm looking around this room, and I believe all of us in here are a product of our education system. Not you, Madam Legal Advisor. You didn't have the privilege of going to school here. <laughs> but the rest of us are. We are products of the education system here. And all of us can hold our own locally, regionally, and internationally. We are no less than because we went to school in Nevis. And so sometimes when I hear the constant natural neighbors of extreme negativity, it, it, it bothers me because it denigrates the things I think that we should be collectively trying to build up, such as our education and education system. So I have heard that the system is failing, but I see here in front of me some results, and I don't have the time, and the minister, with day-to-day -day responsibility, the Honorable Troy Lai, but no doubt, will speak to these in more detail. But for example, at the Gingerland Secondary School, a school that has always been performing at the top in the Federation, that that school this year had an 88.28% pass rate. That's phenomenal. It is lower than it was last year. Last year, they had an unprecedented 96% pass rate but certainly it's consistent with the excellent performance that we've seen at GSS over the years. I think we should commend the teachers, the principal, the teachers, 
and the students there, and the parents, of course, of these students. 88% pass rate for CSEC, that's CXC. We have the private high school, Nevis International Secondary. They had a pass rate of 96.36%. Simply incredible. And I want to just spend a moment because that is the highest pass rate that they've had in six years. Last year, they were at 81%, and this year, they're at 96.36%. And they have continually moved upwards each and every year in terms of delivering the type of results for the people of Nevis. We have also the Charleston Secondary School, the largest of the three high schools. They had a percentage pass rate of 85%. And that was the highest that Charleston has recorded in the last eight years. So again, we're moving in the right direction in relation to the pass rate that we're seeing. So 85% of students who sat exams would have passed. And yet, in, in terms of the exams sat and those passed, an 85% rate at Charlestown, a 96.36% rate at the Nevis International Secondary School, and an 88.28% rate at the Gingerland Secondary School. I think, ladies and gentlemen, by any standard, that has to be applauded. And I would wish to applaud all of the principals, all of the parents, and of course, especially the students who would have sat exams and performed creditively. When we move to KIP, that is now at the sixth form level, we see that at the sixth form level, we had an 86% pass rate this year at the Nevis Sixth Form, 86%. And that is an increase from the 84% that it was last year. And so again, we are trending in the right direction, and I would certainly want to congratulate all. Now, just to mention that we've had, of course, some outstanding performances at the various schools. Um, I had given to me a note, let me find it quickly, in terms of these students. I would just want to mention them for the record and to congratulate them. At the Cape level, we had young Ursha Stapleton. I believe her father is somewhere in the room. Congratulations, sir, to you and the missus and to Ursha, a family of achievers. You know, say sheep don't make goat. So you understand that when you are a family of achievers, you'll get children that achieve, and we congratulate the Stapleton family. But Ursha, we're told, had six unit passes with four ones. We have a young Talia Doe, five unit passes with one, one, grade one. Jack Juan Lawrence, five unit passes with one, grade one. And Opal Kelly, four unit passes with one, grade one. And I want to congratulate all of these students. Um, for second year, those are the first year. Second year students, we had young Tarana Kaka. You've heard that name before, always a top performer. She had 10 unit passes with 10 grade ones. Covincia Webb from Down Hanley's Road, Minister Evelyn, 12 unit passes with seven grade ones. Yuloni Pemberton, nine passes with four grade ones. And Shania Taylor, I see here, with 10 unit passes and three grade ones. And again, excellent performances from our students. At CSS for 2019, we have young Shania Taylor. She got 12 subject passes, seven grade ones. Angelique Liverpool, 10 subject passes, six grade ones. Ricardo Rodriguez, 10 subject passes, four grade ones. Dijonne Hanley, 10 subject passes, five grade ones. Javian Barrett, 10 subject passes, three grade ones. And Briandra Leibert from Brownhill, 10 subject passes with three grade ones. At GSS, we had Kishani Newton, 13 subject passes with two grade ones. Ajuma Leibard, 11 subject passes with seven grade ones. Zwena Jones, 11 subject passes with six grade ones. Clivani Freeman, 10 subject passes with six grade ones. Keveni Brown, 10 subject passes with three grade ones. And Divanu Doe, 10 subject passes with two grade ones. And then at the Nevis International Secondary School, we had Prakriti Dutta who had nine subject passes with nine grade ones. And Jesse Wiley, 
who had seven subject passes with six grade ones. I want to publicly congratulate all of our students, but those named have been among the top performers, and I want to issue from this rostrum congratulations to them and their families, their schools, and their teachers. I want to especially mention young Prakriti Dutta of the Nevis International Secondary School. Uh, based on the preliminary results, and I emphasize that these are preliminary results. Why are they preliminary? Because they have, there's a period for challenge where students can challenge their grade, and that period is still ongoing. So that is why we say this is preliminary, because a grade can change. It can be improved um, as we go. But based on the preliminary result, young Prakriti Dutta of the Nevis International Secondary School with nine subjects and nine grade ones is the best performer in the entire federation. And I think that that ought to be commended. Nevis again, number one. And young Tarana Kaka, with her performance, is the second best performer in the federation for Cape. And so I think that those two students have to be commended. And interestingly enough, I am told that both are products of the Nevis International Secondary School because young Prakriti Dutta is a graduate now of that school, and I'm told Tarana Kaka, I hope I'm correct, also did her, her high school at that school. So it suggests to me that the Nevis inquired unit passes to attain an associate's degree from eight to 10. The local registrar for Sengis and Nevis is a Mr. Solomon Claxton, and he submitted a request to CXC to extend the eight unit associate's degree offering for another two years. We are waiting for a decision from CXC on that. However, in the interim, provisions have been made for the 10 unit associate's degree to be offered in most areas. The 10 units must be completed within five years to attain the degree. Worthy of note is that not, worthy of note, however, is that students who pursue the associate degree because like many other tertiary institutions, CXC also offers a certificate and diploma options. So you have the associate option, the diploma option, and the certificate option. The orientation process for first year students commenced yesterday and will continue for the remainder of the week. Students will have the opportunity to meet with an advisor at the Nevis Sixth Form who will further assist them in subject choices. It is the desire of the Ministry of Education to afford every young person the opportunity to access the associate's degree option and the team at the Nevis Sixth Form will ensure that they work with them to achieve their goals. So I know that there was some discussion in the public square about the associate's degree, and I thought it important to give that update to let you know where we were in regard to that. In the context of education, before I move on quickly, I wanted to indicate that Mrs. Pamela Pemberton, the director of the Navy Sixth Form, has retired. And the note that I have said she retired on the 31st of August, 2019. We all know Mrs. Pemberton. I don't think I need to say too much. She has contributed and contributed and contributed. She has contributed well and above what one would normally require. And she has led the sixth form for many years with distinction. And I would want to wish her all the very best in her retirement. And whatever the next phase holds for her, I would want to wish her success as she embarks on her next phase and thank her for her many, many, many years of service in the vineyard of education. And the last set of service she did was with us at the Nevis Sixth Form College. And during that time, I can say, our Sixth Form has performed creditably. We have asked Principal Juan Williams to direct the day-to-day -day operations at the Nevis Sixth Form. And the ministry will shortly complement Principal Williams with a supportive administrative staff to assist with the daily operations of the institution. Orientation is currently ongoing at the Nevis Sixth Form, supervised by Principal Williams. Let me move very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, to just a few other items before I open the floor for questions. I wanted to give a quick update on the proposed park at Pinnis. We realized that we had, the, of course, the historic visit of President Tsai, the president of Taiwan. And uh, there we have a resident consultant from Taiwan, Vincent Lai, and he is lead on the project. That project is well and truly on the way. We have already commenced the propagation of plants that will be used at Pinnis Park 
two areas have been designated at Cades Bay for that purpose. We have decided to proceed with a Taiwanese company, Quan Jun Construction Company, to build the Pinnis Beach Park. The reason for that is that they have good experience. They were the ones who built the Echo Park in St. Kitts, and we are working closely with them. We will sign that contract, we hope, shortly. There will be a meeting of key stakeholders just next week that will be involved in the construction of the park so that everybody could be clear as to what their roles are. And within three months of the construction contract being signed, we'll have detailed architectural and landscape drawings. And of course, we will undertake the necessary environmental impact assessment. The intention has always been that we will commence construction this year. And so we look forward to that. And I want to publicly thank Permanent Secretary John Hanley, who has been working on this project. He has taken over, I believe, Tamika Lawrence, who was with us, uh, used to be the lead on this project. John has taken over since Tamika has gone to other employment at the moment. I wanted to sound a perhaps a, a sad note. I received some indication and have now received a formal note from the Department of Marine Resources that a nesting sea turtle was poached, not use elegant language, was killed, taken from Cades Bay Beach on the 8th of August, 2019. A nesting sea turtle was illegally taken from Caysbury Beach on 8th August 2019. Under the fisheries regulations, it is illegal to interfere with a nesting sea turtle. And there are fines of up to $5,000 for doing so. Our nesting sea turtle population is already extremely small. And removal of one nesting female can have a catastrophic impact on the population. The matter was reported to the Cotton Ground Police Station, and we are hopeful that patrols of nesting beaches such as Lover's Beach and the Cotton Ground to Cades Bay area and Cliff Dwellers Beach will be stepped up. Unfortunately, it appears that there was a second such incident at Cades Bay between 31st August and 2nd September. These are serious matters, ladies and gentlemen, and serious setbacks. And I'm appealing to our people, our fishermen, that you're not doing yourself or the island any value by engaging in this type of illegal activity. We have recently arranged through Jessup's Barnsgood and Cotton Ground Fishers Association with funding from Jeff for a group of our fisher folk to travel to see the Stacia Marine Park. Stacia, just next door. And I have had the opportunity to speak to at least one of them who went. And they were commending, commenting, I'm sorry, on the amount of fish that they were able to see in Stacia. The chap said to me that they swam out just a little distance and the size and quantity of fish that they were seeing in Stacia was unbelievable. Here in Nevis, the fishermen continue to go out farther and farther and getting fewer and fewer fish. And it tells me that unless we as a people and the fisher folk themselves seek to conduct themselves in accordance with the law, that pretty soon we will have no fish at all, no turtles at all, no lobsters, no conch. Oftentimes, we have an attitude that we can take and take and take because somehow the supply is inexhaustible. That is simply not true. It is not true. And if we have put rules in place to forbid the harvesting of turtles during their nesting season, then for God's sake, please, honor and respect the rules. And that is why as Premier, you know, I don't want a soul to call me. If the police catch you, I want them to deal with you to the harshest possible extent because we are not foolish people. We understand what the rules are and we continue to breach the rules and in so doing, create problems for the island. I saw on social media someone put up a gruesome picture of a turtle that was clearly illegally killed. Why? Why? What is the value? And the answer is none. No value whatsoever. And so I'm asking our fisher folk, I'm speaking directly to them, that unless you conduct yourself within the boundaries of the law, 
and recognize that conducting yourself within the boundaries of the law is ultimately for the benefit of you and your family. I recall in our personal situation, I tried to help out a fisherman. He came one day and he said he had some lobsters. But regrettably, most of the hotels were closed, restaurants, you know, the low season. So I said to him, how much? And he gave me a price to mature. And if we keep going out and we keep taking the smallest of them, we keep harvesting the females that are laden with eggs, we keep harvesting the little conks, all against the law. We keep trying to harvest and kill turtles when they're nesting. We are ultimately destroying our livelihood. And sometimes, if people can't understand that what they do affect others, maybe you should explain to them that it affects them and their families. So when a fisherman now in Nevis complains how much gas he has to buy to go 30 miles now, out in the ocean, with no guarantee that he will catch even a pound of fish, it should be a wake-up message to them that they have a duty to protect their livelihoods. I can only speak from this rostrum. I can only try to provide some leadership on the various issues. But at the end of the day, our people must recognize. And if now the fisher folk are going to Stacia, and themselves are marveling at how much fish they see in Stacia. That is because Stacia and the people of Stacia have taken a position that this is a resource that has to be protected. And by protecting it, they ensure that the fisher folk have a livelihood for the rest of their life and for those who are yet to come. And we in Nevis, I feel, need to have that same type of attitude. We need to recognize that these actions hurt us all. And I condemn unreservedly this illegal poaching of turtles. I think that the police need to do what they need to do. And whoever out there is involved with it should be condemned and should be subject to the full extent of the law. We will celebrate this year on October 16th our World Food Day, and this is for the Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, the theme this year in our actions are our future, health diets for a zero hunger world. That is what we're seeking to promote, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about it as we go. The Department of Agriculture also hosted a 21st annual student job attachment program over the summer, and students were exposed to all that the department does including vet services, abattoir meat processing, plant propagation, agro-processing, marketing and extension services. Again, the desire to get more young people involved in agriculture so that we can feed ourselves. I would like to remind the general public that we are in the teeth of the hurricane season. We can only look to the Bahamas where I started with Hurricane Duran to see the damage and the devastation to life and property that that storm can cause. And so I am again appealing to our people to be vigilant and please to pay attention to the warnings and do not let our guards down and take it for granted. If we needed any reminder in 2017, we had Maria and Irma. And now, less than two years later, we have the devastation of the Rhine with massive loss of life and property. So please, let us heed the warnings and do the best that we can to stay safe. I will be shortly finished. I just want to report on a few other matters. We have had, ladies and gentlemen, I think we go to the house on 17th of this month. You would recognize that we had made a commitment to be in the house at least once every two months. Um, that commitment has slipped slightly by a few weeks, and we apologize for that, but we will be there on the 17th. Uh, in the Nevis Island Assembly. And of course, we invite the general public to be a part of that. I wanted to just say a word about the closing of the Brown Hill Communications. All of us were very saddened that the sudden news that Brown Hill Communications, which has been with us for over 10 years, that they were closing their doors. That closure has impacted 138 workers. 
I was advised by our Minister of Labor, the Honorable Spencer Brand, just yesterday that some 20 or so workers will continue until the end of September. And then I think they have one or two that will continue for a little bit of time. But generally speaking, 138 workers have been displaced. I am satisfied that some have already found jobs. I'm happy for them. But of course, that was a significant employer in Nevis that has closed its doors. I have made a public address on the matter. I don't propose to go over what I said. But I want to commend Minister Brand, Gary Leiber at Labor Department, and their team, because I think that in a very difficult situation, we really did the best that we could. We discussed with the owners and operators of Brownell Communications, and they were able to offer a fairly generous package to the workers. Some workers, I think, will get as much as six months' salary. In addition, working with the Honorable Van Samery, and I would want to go on record on thanking him as the Federal Minister of Labor and his team, including Bishop Ron Collins, because they really worked very closely and quickly with us here in Nevis to sort out the severance payment that is due to workers. Some workers, again, based on long service, will get up to six months severance payment. So the truth is that some workers, we hope, will get as much as a year's salary in their hands in short order. I'm told that the payments from Brown and Communication will be finalized on September 20th, and that thereafter, we hope in the early parts of October to have the severance payments paid. I'm told that the federal authorities have said, out of an abundance of caution, to say the end, by the end of October, but the intention is to pay within the first week of October. And so we are hopeful that we can get paid by the first week of October. We want to continue to say to the workers that we have been there with them, we understand that this is a very challenging time for them and their families. We want to encourage them to manage the money that they're going to receive in a lump sum carefully because there's no guarantee when they will be able to find employment. So if they have a month or two while they try to source new employment, we are hopeful that they will manage this lump sum that they would have received. Because as I said, most will receive a pretty significant lump sum in their hand at one time. In order to help them, the government has waived any taxes on the money that they will receive. And I think that is, again, another indication of our effort to partner with and show that we care. This situation, clearly, was not of our making. It was not of their making. Big companies make decisions that is in their interest as corporate entities. And I was very shocked at the decision. You know, I commented to Pierce Colin Doe that the irony of ironies is the last meeting he and I had with Brownell Communication, which was just a few months ago, we were talking about expansion. And we were waiting to hear from them about expansion when, on a Friday afternoon, they came and tell us they're closing down. So it just tells you the fickle nature sometimes of business. We can't argue with them. We can only thank them for the service that they've given over the past decade plus and to wish them well in terms of whatever they next do. It is us now, as a government, to seek to create the environment where people can find work. And to that end, we are in advanced discussions with some other players, which we hope will bear some fruit, and I hope to come back to you when I have something substantive. In the meantime, our prayers continue with these workers and their families, and we continue to commit to them that we will do everything that we can to ensure that they transition to gainful employment in short order. The other big story in terms of labor was clearly the Four Seasons Resort. We all know because I've made countless statements on it from the parliament, on radio, and here in this press conference, that the resort closed its doors on the 1st of June for the months of June, July, August, and September for purposes of a massive renovation that they were doing. We have had a lot of chatter in the public square about it, but my job is to bring the facts to you. And this government has again demonstrated that it cares because we sat in a very difficult fiscal situation for the government at this time. And we decided unanimously as a cabinet that we will offer 1,000 EC dollars to each of the workers that was affected by the closure at Four Seasons. I believe it was some 363 or thereabouts workers who were impacted 
by the closure. And those were the workers who are now only getting 25% of what their usual salary would be. We understand that people were suffering. And so we decided that we would make a one-off payment to assist them with back to school expenses. Now, Nevis is Nevis, and naturally the argument came, what if they didn't have any children going back to school? And the response simply is that sometimes people who are without children of their own have more children than people who have children of their own. What I mean by that is that as a community, all of us have got children, all of us have neighbors, all of us support each other. And so notwithstanding that someone may not have had a child in school, I am pretty sure they may have nieces and nephews, they have family, they have got children that they would assist. And so we decided, rather than going down there with a sheet to ask, you have children, you have children going to school, that we make the funds available to all of those who would have suffered from the closure and were only getting the 25%. I have had a lot of private feedback, and I believe that people were pleased that the government extended itself to them in this way. I had occasion to speak to the general manager of Four Seasons this morning. Spoke to him via telephone. And he also confirmed to me that, as promised, the homeowners down there donated some 150,000 US dollars. And that the workers, again, the same 300 plus workers who were affected most by the closure, would have each shared equally in that money. And they would have been paid sometime in August. When you did the, do the math, that works out to maybe another 1,000 EC dollars that each would have received from the homeowners. I just want to make it pellucid to the public that the homeowners never gave the government any money to give to anybody. The money that the government gave came from us, the Treasury. And the homeowners have separately, I'm advised this morning, paid 150,000 US dollars and the workers have shared that equally amongst them. And I thank the homeowners, and I'm happy that the workers got that additional relief as well. I am also pleased to say that the general manager this morning confirmed that workers will be back to work on September 16th as scheduled. And so today is now the 5th, is it? And so we figure that in 11 days, the long, hard summer will be over and that workers will be going back to work at the Four Seasons Resort as scheduled. He indicates that the resort reopens on October 1st, and that while they will still have some other work to do, because naturally with the construction, just like with the schools project, you have delays. They will have some additional work to do, but he said they will be receiving their first guests by October 4th. And I believe that is good news for Nevis. Now, why are workers going back on September 16th if the first guest doesn't come until October 4th? It's because they're going to have a massive retraining. And he has advised that they're going to do that in two tranches, one starting on, on September 16th and the other starting sometime, I believe, around the 23rd or thereabouts of September. So all the workers of Four Seasons who have really been out of work and have been struggling over the past few months, Four Seasons, I think, has done what it could with the 25%. The homeowners have chipped in with 150,000 US dollars. The government has chipped in with 363, 368,000 EC dollars. And the workers now hopefully go back to work on the 16th of September. So I'm grateful for that, grateful for that news. And to God be the glory, I trust and hope that this long, difficult summer is now really and truly over for those workers at the Four Seasons. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that I will leave it there and uh, invite comments and questions from the press, if they have any, and uh, to try the best that I can to respond to those comments and questions uh, as they arise. And certainly we look forward to the usual rigorous exchange with members of the press. Thank you very much. Pleasant good morning to one and all. My good morning, good morning, Mr. Hanley. Morning. My name is Bjorn Hanley, and I am representing BHC Media, which is one of the fastest growing media companies in all of St. Kitts and Nevis. 
It's the premier. Um, let's start where you ended at Four Seasons Resort, Davis. Uh, several weeks ago, I received a call from a distraught lady who's working at Four Seasons still. And uh, she was very upset. She said, uh, basically, uh, they're not getting any service charge down there. And uh, all her money goes to the bank. And uh, when, the bank, when the bank receives her paycheck, the bank holds all her money. So she don't know when last she got even a dollar from her paycheck. And then she saw that the government is giving out $1,000 uh, to workers that was laid off. They're being paid 25%. Homeowners are, is also giving out money to um, those workers who are laid off. So she, she, her point was, what is the help? Where is the help coming from the government for those workers who are at Four Seasons still, uh, who are not receiving service charge or any assistance at all? Uh, so if you could comment on that, that would be great. Uh, question number two, Overseas Voters Amendment Act. Uh, Mr. Premier, several months ago, uh, the federal government brought the first reading of the, what they call the Overseas Voters Amendment <coughs> Act. It's not called that, um, <coughs> Mr. Hanley. Uh, is it, it's, it's a it's National it's Assembly Elections Amendment yes. Act. Uh, but people are, you have citizens calling it that. Yes, but for the fastest growing media house, just be accurate so that you can go even faster. All right. So, Appreciate you know, it's important. You yeah. Thank you. Uh, so that was brought for the first reading several months ago, and um, there was this talk about six months residency uh, will be required. Now, just last, last week, uh, the order paper that was released for Parliament that was held on Tuesday, the, that act the, um, what do you call it, the Elections Act? National Assembly Elections National Amendment. National Assembly Amendment Act was on the other paper. But a uh, day before ele uh, Parliament, that was pulled, hurriedly pulled from the other paper without any consultation at all. Can you give a reason why that bill was pulled without consultation? And uh, can you also let us know if that bill is over now, if it's dead, or if it's going to come back again sometime in the future. Can you clarify that for us, please? And also, uh, Navy Sixth Form College, can you clarify if the associate degree will be offered in two years still? Or is that going to take longer? Or can you give some details on that? Uh, if you could answer these three, and then I could... Uh, I will come back again with some, some more questions. Okay. Thank Th you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanley, and congratulations on the rapidity of growth. Yes, fastest growing um, <clears throat> media company in the Federation, you say? Uh, knowing, your, knowing your propensity for hyperbole, I would have thought you would have said in the world, but you have limited yourself thus far in the world. Okay, I realize you'll get, you'll, you'll get there. Bit by bit, yes, indeed. Um, <clears throat> in relation to the associate degree, I made a statement in my opening remarks, um, and uh, the officials at education have advised that we have asked permission to continue with the eight-unit associate's degree. So the registrar in St. Kitts, Mr. Solomon, and I'm told that we're waiting for a response. We should have a response by October of 2019. In the interim, Provisions have been made for the 10-unit associate's degree to be offered in most areas. The 10 units must be completed within five years to attain the degree. That's the, those are the rules from CXC, within five years. Um, so students, of course, can also pursue the certificate and diploma options. So we have the associate degree option, the diploma option, and the certificate option that will be available to students. Other hotels on the island which close, Montpellier is now closed. Golden Rock is now closed. Nisbet Plantation has indicated they will close, I think, for a month or thereabouts. They have workers too. But those workers go through that process every year. And they order their affairs, their personal affairs, to sort the circumstances that they have. Now, 
The situation with the Four Seasons was an unusual situation because ordinarily Four Seasons would be open throughout the year. And the government and the cabinet responded to the unusual nature of that situation, bearing in mind it was not the fault of the workers. Indeed, Four Seasons has said that they are improving to come back bigger and better. And they indicated that they would have to close because if you have seen the work that was being done, you recognize they could not stay open because that work was central in terms of the location and the hotel, pools and all that were demolished and replaced, etc. So we thought that we would seek to benefit those who were most negatively affected by the closure. And those were the persons who effectively were only at home getting 25% of their salaries. So if you are at Four Seasons still and getting 100% of your salary, notwithstanding that the service charge was not present because there are no guests, I believe that you're in a different position. You're in a better position than someone who was only getting 25%. And that is why, as a government, we thought that we would help those most affected. Bearing in mind everybody is affected, even the government. When Four Seasons closes, the government revenue takes a hit as well. But when we looked at the workers down there, you cannot tell me, Mr. Handley, that a worker who continued to work as usual because they were in security or they were in a management position or they were in some position where their work was not affected by the closure, that that person is in the same position as a housekeeper or someone who is a server who had no work for the last four months. And so the government decided to try and help those that were most affected. It doesn't mean that other people, like the lady you have described, were not affected and didn't feel some pinch as well. But the government is not in a position to help everybody. And so we thought it was an extraordinary circumstance to which we responded, and that is how we opted to respond. And uh, I have had calls. So I don't doubt what you're saying because some people have called me and said, well, they got children going to school too. Somebody called me and said, well, you don't give all the people at Montpellier and Golden Rock and everywhere else. And I would love to do that. Matter of fact, if it were in my power, I'd give you a check now to advance the fortunes of BHC. BHC, you call it? Yes, BHC. BHC. Right? So the reality is that we, we, we would like to do, but we are constrained in terms of what we can do. And I would want the public to appreciate that there are limits in terms of what the government is able to do. And I also think, and I don't mean to, to, to be disparaging in any way, but it's a conversation that I continue to have with members of the public. It's a constant conversation, in fact, we recently had at the federal cabinet, that our people have to be encouraged to be responsible. I know people don't like to hear it. Matter of fact, a strong support and advisor of mine politically tell me the quickest way to lose an election is to tell people what they don't want to hear. But our people have to be responsible. Too many of our people go by TDC, they go by Hosford, they go by Coates, and they pick up something. You look nice, you know, when you go on the shelf and you see toaster, $9 a month. Refrigerator. $29 a month, and they say, okay, let me take the toaster, the refrigerator, the 40-inch TV. The 40-inch TV don't show better than the 20-inch. You see the person bigger, that's all. But some of our people overextend themselves and run themselves into difficulty because on top of all these commitments, they still have children. They still have to eat. Many still have to parent. And so rather than focusing on making sure that the basics are covered, we're wondering what the latest outfit going to be for White Sands and the VV, VIP, because they put on a whole heap of V now on the IP for what you call it, music festival. And that is what people focus on. And I have no difficulty with it, you know, Mr. Hanley. My position is if you can afford it, do it. Enjoy yourself. Blessed be unto you, and I wish you more. But if you find yourself in a position where you're constrained by your income, well, I don't think it is unreasonable to say to people, take care of basics first. And leave some of the excesses until you can afford to do it. 
So a lot of people come and they say, oh, I run myself into a problem here, I run myself into a problem there. They have debt here, debt there, debt everywhere. They go by some of the places I hear um, lending money. What they call them, fast cash? The cash might be fast, but it's painful. It's painful because they go and they get the fast cash and the interest on it, the amount they have to pay back. They find themselves perpetually in a situation of taking borrowing from Peter to try and pay Paul. And so, Mr. Hanley, through your enormous and far-reaching and vast organization, media empire that you've built, I believe that you have an obligation to try and continue to help us educate and help each other. And to say to our people that, you know, difficult times will come. And even the good Bible tells us, you know, in time of plenty, you store up your grain. Your mom is a, is, a, is a wonderful Christian lady. And I'm sure she would have taught you in times of plenty, store up your grain. Because as sure as night follows day, there will be times of famine and difficulty as well. And that is what we must do. When rain falling, that's where we have a cistern. We store water. So when in terms of drought, you have cistern water that you can rely on. Just so with our people. When you have a chance to make a little extra, put something aside because you never know where sickness lies. You never know where difficulty lies. But some of our people, the attitude is that I must spend every penny that I have, max out my credit cards, take every credit that quotes and them have to offer. I don't mean to bash any company, I don't mean it in that way, but take every credit facility available. And then I find myself now, a young lady came to me and told me that when she has paid all her debts, she's in a good job, but when she has paid all her debts, she has $50 left for the month to survive on. And what are the debts? You know, you owe for a TV, you owe for a washing machine, you owe for this kind of thing. And I've said to her, well, couldn't you have delayed any of those? so that you can feed yourself and your child. And as I tell you, people don't like to hear that. But sometimes you need to say it because every single person, unless you won the lotto, every single person in this country who has conducted themselves lawfully during their lives have had to build. You start out and you build. That's what, you don't ever get a skyscraper which starts in the air. It starts with a foundation. You start to build. Some people bought a little piece of land when they were in their 20s. They paid off for it 10 years later. Then they start to build a little house. They may pay off for that 15, 20 years later, but that's how you build. And too many of our people have been encouraged to have instant gratification. So you see it, you want it, you grab it, with no thought of how you pay for it. You know how much young people I see around here with iPhone, what them called? 10 and 12 and 15? Sometime before the, the, the man in charge of the, the, the what name? in charge of Apple. Huh? Before he could announce the iPhone good. School children don't have it. And I wonder myself because I am somebody who's working and I wonder myself sometimes how where do the resources for these things come from? And why? Because I have an iPhone 6, I believe it is, it's now up to 10 or 12 or whatever. But the 6 works fine. So I must throw that away simply because they bring out one with a different number. I mean, again, if you could afford to do it, do it. I have no problem with that. But there's a very real danger in trying to keep up with the Joneses. So I believe if you name Hanley, you stay in Hanley Lane until Hanley is in a position to get into Jones's lane. But the thing of constantly watching over your fence and seeing where your neighbor eating and drinking and where your neighbor driving and trying to put yourself in that race, I think that our people need to guard against it. And the old time principles that used to guide us, save your money, invest, be prudent and wise, that those principles have served our forefathers and continue to serve us well. And I think we should think about that. But I say all that to say that I empathize with the lady who has complained to you, Mr. Hanley, but we really could not help everybody. And we opted as a cabinet to help those who are most affected. 
you talked about the overseas voters, and you say something was removed from the order paper without consultation. Um, I should point out that there is never consultation in relation to matters that go on or off an order paper. That is always a matter for the government and for the leader of government business. And that this particular bill that you spoke about was removed because my understanding is that some additional work is necessary and some additional discussions are necessary. And so whether it will come back again, I can't tell you. That will be a matter for the leader of government business at the federal level to speak. But I know it has been withdrawn at the last sitting and that some discussions are ongoing in relation to that particular matter. So I suppose we will hear more, you and I, as the days and weeks go on in relation to that. Yes, Mr. Lee. Good morning. Yes, good morning, good morning. sir. Uh, a couple of questions. Well, the last part, the last response was, that's one of my questions. Um, the, what's the status on the BNL deal at the Vansabli Army International Airport? We're in September right now, so um, if you have any update on that. And the other one has to do with Culturama. I know the price giving was, has been postponed, and the chairman of Culturama made some comments about sponsors not coming up on time. What's the status on that and what they have to say in relation to the Culturama price giving? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Um, the airport matter, very good question. I had promised an update on the last occasion. Um, I have met with the representatives from that company. They have brought their preliminary designs uh, for the project. I believe that they are to come back uh, to meet with the full cabinet and to present those, and the cabinet will then have an opportunity to say whether this is something we want, uh, this is what they're proposing, or whether it goes beyond um, or outside the ambit of what it is we would like to see for Nevis. So that is being arranged at this time, um, but they have produced a preliminary design which they've shared with me as the Premier and uh, which the Cabinet will have access to. So that is as much as I can tell you by way of update, and we hope to have something further soon once we're able to meet with the team um, who are to come to meet with the Cabinet on this matter. Culture Armand Prize given, I believe I can't... I'm told next Friday. We're going to have prize giving in town in the afternoon. So we, the minister is now telling me that we have a date for prize giving. We apologize certainly for the delay, uh, but next Friday in Charleston we should have the prize giving. And the delay was, I believe, as Mr. Uh, Abernathy, I would have pointed out, that we had some delays in terms of sponsorships and the sponsors making good on their commitments. Um, I think that it is, it is um, not unusual that after Culture Armour, we tend to have a few delays in terms of people getting paid. Uh, one lady, my good friend, called me and remonstrated strongly, says it's been three weeks and she wants her money. So I had to remind her that in previous times and under previous dispensations, sometimes when the next Culture Armour came was when you were getting your money and that she ought to be a little patient because she's a usual vendor and she understands that her money is sure and that she will in fact get her money. It isn't, doesn't mean that I am in any way downplaying the need of people to be paid when they have rendered services, but I'm just asking for our people to be a little patient and understand that each year we try to do the very best we can. And matter of fact, I think in the last few years, we've done quite well in that we have usually been able to pay out within a few months all the bills associated with Culture Armour. And I think that um, very rarely have we gone over into the next year. We have always been able to do it within a few months, a month or two, and sometimes three. And so now we know that the prize giving is going to happen on Friday. I hope that that will at least give a little comfort. Next Friday, not this Friday, but next Friday, will give a little comfort to those who are awaiting their, their prize money. We thank, of course, all of those who performed and those who were involved. I believe, and I should have done it at the outset, I, I forgot that I didn't have a press conference since the end of Culture Armour. So let me congratulate Minister Evelyn. Um, they now call him Mr. Culture Armour. He did boast, he's a boastful fellow sometimes, and he did boast and tell us that he will produce the best Culture Armour. And I, I, I said I would wait and see, but I think that I must confess that Culture Armour 45, by all accounts, was the best Culture Armour. And I'm being told here that he 
wasn't satisfied, so he took it to Trinidad as well and uh, performed, I'm told, on the Savannah Grass in Trinidad uh, for purposes of Carifesta. So he not only stole the show here in Nevis, he went to Trinidad and stole it there as well. And so, Minister Evelyn, we want to commend you and the team, your prominent secretary, Mr. Glasgow, of course. Um, I see Mr. Rollins here from the NCDF. I see, of course, um, as usual, Mr. Abernathy Leibert. And all of those are the secretariat and elsewhere who really, really gave of their best. And I think that this has gone down in the books as one of the very best, the finest culture armor that you have seen. I also want to go on record to thank the people who came to support. I mean, Juve morning, the pictures and, and videos I saw from Charleston, I couldn't believe. I could not believe that there were that number of people on the streets in Charleston. And so our brothers and sisters from St. Kitts who came over in their thousands, I really want to thank them. And again, and I think that this is important, to commend the security forces, because we've now gone seven straight culture armors with no incidents whatsoever. And that again speaks to the, the peace and the peace dividend that we now have in the country. Seven years now, we've had no incidents. And to have that size of crowd with no incident, I think is remarkable. So Minister Evelyn, congratulations to you and the team. And I, I wait to see now what's gonna happen because having gone to this height, I don't know where we go from here insofar as culture armor is concerned. We have 50 that's coming up. And I'm pretty sure that you will be still there as the minister, God willing, at 50, culture arm of 50, and maybe 55 and 60 as well. Um, since I'm told that you have no opponent in Gingerland um, who is either declared or approved. And so we look forward, certainly, to you continuing in your role. Any other questions for me? Good morning, Monique Washington, St. Kitts Nevis Observer newspaper. Um, Mr. Premier, recently Nevlek would have appointed the new GM. Um, my question is, is he on a contract? And if he is, is there any plans by the NIA or by Nevlek during this time to have a division trained to hold that position in the future? And on Culturama, the issue with sponsors not paying fast enough or coming up with their end of the bargain fast enough. Has there been any consideration by the Ministry of Culture and with the Cultural Armor Secretariat to ensure that something like this doesn't happen again when it comes to sponsors not paying their dues? Um, social media policy. Last time I asked that question, you said that it wasn't doing that well. Um, when will the heads of the departments make sure that this policy is enforced or will this policy just, you know, lie by the west side, and that is it for now. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm happy that you've asked the question about the heads of departments enforcing the policies because it's something that I continue to ask them to do as well. Um, certainly policies are articulated by the cabinet. It is for the prominent secretaries and the assistant prominent secretaries and the heads of department, the supervisors, etc., to enforce. And so I can only join you in appealing to the heads of department to do their job and to police these matters and to ensure that all of us conduct ourselves in accordance with the policies that have been set out. Just to recap and remind that the social media policy was really intended to curb what we considered to be an abuse by civil servants of social media during working hours. And many of them were spending their time on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram rather than on the matters that should be occupying their time, which is a service to the people of Nevis. And so that really was the motivation behind it. It wasn't new because all that we said in the social media policy was actually pulled from existing regulations that govern the public service. And so I can only join you in appealing publicly to our department heads to do what they know they're supposed to do and to ensure that the social media policy, like all other policies, that they are adhered to. In relation to sponsors not paying on time, I think that we will have hiccups from time to time. I don't know that this is a crisis. It is just a matter that sometimes these things happen. And so what we will do is what we always do, which is to try and ensure that we have the best possible relationship with our sponsors and to hope that we don't have a reoccurrence of a delay. Um, I don't think that there was any ill will or ill intention by our sponsors. I think that these things just happen and that the ministry took the decision 
that they would have the price given at a time when clearly the prizes were in hand and that they could pay out to the various participants in the various shows. And now that we have a date, it clearly means that the ministry is satisfied that all that is necessary will be in place for the 15th, that is, of, of September. It's not September, of, 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 of the 13th, sorry, the 13th of September. So um, we, 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 I don't know that anything additional is necessary, uh, Ms. Washington. Nevlek and the new GM, yes, Nevlek would have put out a, a release indicating to the public that they have a new GM. He appears to be a young man who's eminently qualified. Yes, he would be on contract, and yes, it is our intention to ensure that he's understudied so that at the appropriate time, uh, someone who is from Nevis can elevate him or herself to that position. I would just wish to say that in the past we have tried. Um, Nevlek has in fact invested, I'm advised, uh, when the Honorable Alexis Jeffers was the minister in charge, that there was investment in terms of trying to equip um, local persons to be in a position, but sometimes, of course, the local person may not be interested in that position, and so we have to continue our effort. But the short answer to you, Ms. Washington, is I think it's an excellent question, and I feel that we must continue to try to develop our human resource capacity to the point where divisions can control all, all of the top positions in the island, and we will continue to do that. But certainly, Nevlek found itself at a crossroad. We needed to get a particular type of management and management expertise in hand as quickly as we can and the board took a decision, and therefore we have a new manager, who I believe is a two-year two -year contract that he will have. So we will hope to have some youngsters identified that can understudy. Okay, uh, Brown Hill Communications is officially closed. I uh, took note, however, that you said that uh, the severance package will be paid in full on the first week of October. So my question is, is that facility in place for everybody or just Brownhill communication? Because I know severance package normally take months, several months to come through. Yes. So is that in place for everybody or just Brownhill communication? And also, can you give us an update on Paradise Beach Hotel that is officially closed as well? And uh, also an update on geothermal, geothermal and uh, the Freedom of Information Bill. And also, Mr. Premier, we know we have an election that is due next year. And uh, up to date, all the candidates in sync, it's have been announced. And we saw a couple weeks ago, uh, Dr. Daly announced his candidacy uh, on live radio uh, that he will be contesting, challenging you, Mr. Premier, for the uh, federal seat come next federal elections. Uh, people are asking if the if, if you are going to feel any candidates at all, like when is the CCM party plan to field announced candidates? Because we've been hearing all three, but currently there are no candidates announced for the CCM party. Only the only uh, only NRP would have announced candidates so far. So we uh, can you. Give us some details on that. Um, can you help us, Mr. Hanley, who are the NRP candidates that they've announced? The NRP candidates, uh, yeah. we, we have Dr. Daly, yes. who would have announced his candidacy. Mm -hmm. And um, in number 11, we would have, have, we have Patrice Nisbet, who is the current uh, representative for constituency number 11. Yes. And over in number 10, I think it was made clear several months ago that young Beyond Hanley <laughs> will be running over there and he will be running to win in miraculous fashion the constituency 10 yes. in historic 
fashion over there in Gingerland. So uh, currently, we have two representatives over there in Gingerland. Uh, <coughs> there's some question that would have been asked who the candidate would be. Mm -hmm. Currently, there's none. So uh, the people are now saying that young Bjorn Hanley is running unopposed. He is running unopposed in Gingerland. And he's going to take it home in miraculous fashion. Uh, so that's We, we that. recognize that you like to come and say what the people are saying. People are saying well, that. When I ask which people, you don't have any. People are calling for uh, that too. The people on the road? They want, huh? People on people the road? People all over, on the road, in the air, on the ground, <laughs> at home. And abroad. Everywhere. Uh, yes. And uh, <laughs> the last question is small business support. Yes. Several weeks ago, Mr. Mervyn Hanley, in a, fa in, a, in a good Facebook post, um, made a, a wonderful plan. He asked, uh, why don't the government uh, provide support for small businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, um, under the condition that they would hire some employees, and this would ease the burden of employment on government. And BHC Media would have received a number of phone calls asking with people asking for work. And I would have made some promises that I would hire uh, several persons in mm -hmm. short order. So um, what my question is, um, what support will you provide for small and medium-sized businesses so that they can hire citizens and take the pressure off of government? Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanley. Um, small business support. Let me start there. Um, I had hoped that uh, certainly BHC Media would have been hiring quite a few people already since you started out by telling us the phenomenal growth that you are experiencing. I didn't realize that you were depending on government assistance in order to, to grow and to hire people. So um, our our effort always is to promote and encourage small businesses. And I feel businesses such as your own, um, we continue to encourage our people to embark on business development, that it is not only the government, but certainly entrepreneurship, particularly small businesses, uh, which provide a backbone to most economies. Uh, we have the Small Enterprise Development Unit, SIDU, which continues to do excellent work. Um, CEDU continues to provide support of up to 25,000 EC dollars to small businesses. These are clearly micro loans that we provide. But the idea is for some people, say if you want to do hair braid and you want to do a little barbecue business, you want to whatever, then the loan is geared and pitched to that level. We are also shortly to announce, I hope, the plan that we have announced to um, a $5 million fund where we'll have a revolving fund um, um, assisted through some assistance from the Taiwanese of $5 million, so it's not huge, but that fund we have indicated will be limited to women and others under 35. So let me, I need to say this properly. Women of all ages and men who are under 35. Um, the idea is to empower women and empower youth. So that fund we are saying will be up to a maximum of $100,000, and we hope that we'll be able to launch that fairly soon. So the government is mindful of the point that you're making about supporting small businesses. We feel that small business growth is certainly an area that any serious government has to encourage. And we recognize that the government can't employ everybody. Four Seasons can't employ everybody. And TDC and Hosfords and the others can't employ everybody. So people, I think, who have ability and have the entrepreneurial spirit. That too has to be encouraged. And I marvel all the time, and I say it publicly all the time, that we see people coming in from outside Nevis, people from other islands and other countries, and in no time they have a little business because I think they come with a different type of mindset. And a lot of individuals go off to university and their first, their first quest once they come out of university is to apply for a job. Whereas you find a lot of other people, their first instinct is to open a business. And I think that that is part of what we have to look at as well. I spent a lot of time in Anguilla over the years. And I've always admired the entrepreneurial spirit in Anguilla. Nearly everywhere you drive in Anguilla, you see a sign for a little business. 
because Anguillans are kind of independent thinking and independent people. And so they have done things in a particular way. And I've always admired that. And so that is something that we're trying to encourage here as well. So that is why the last, when you remember, when you announced BHC, your new empire, I really congratulated you because I think it was a good thing that you were doing in engaging in what you do and to do a small business. So we encourage all small businesses and we'll continue to support them. Just to point out that CEDU also provides advice and support. And we've done things like, for example, QuickBooks. We've had sessions to teach people about QuickBooks, how to manage. But one of the, the things we've recognized, you know, a lot of people involved in business in Nevis have no idea if they're making money or they're losing money. No idea. Because they make some money, they put it in their left pocket, and they pay some money out of their right pocket. But unless you have proper accounting, you have a proper costing. If you're selling pigs, you must know what it costs to produce that pig so that you can price your meat properly. If you're selling I mean, meal, a meal, you must know what it costs, how much for the chicken, how much for the rice, how much for the labor that goes into that meal. So when you tell a man $40 for a plate of food, you should know that in that plate of food you have $5 profit, you have whatever. So the, the, the keeping of records and the accounting process is a very important process. It's also important for the taxman because a lot of times when Inland Revenue comes and Inland Revenue says to you, you're doing, you look like you're doing good business and you owe tax and you don't know because you have no proper records. And then you get what is called an assessment by Inland Revenue and then it's pure confusion because Inland Revenue is telling you you owe the money and you have to argue now back and forth. So it is actually in the interest of our small business people to understand that record keeping is also very important. And accounting, that accounting function lets them know whether they're in the red or in the black, whether they're making profit or they're making a loss. And so CEDU has provided that type of training. It also has provided workshops. It has provided and continues to provide advice. So sometimes you have, for example, in your head a business idea, but you want now to reduce it to a plan, a proposal. CEDU also offers all of that. So we have been doing quite a bit. Maybe we need to talk about it more, but we have been doing quite a bit. Um, candidates and candidacies, I've said to you in the past, you've queried that, raised that question, and I've said that the time for that will come, and we'll make the announcements when necessary. We're not there yet, um, and so I can't comment further on that. Um, we are a party, as you know, which is a very serious political party, a political force, not only in the island of Nevis, but in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. And I think that when the candidates are announced, it, I suspect that you yourself, Mr. Hanley, might support the candidate um, for the CCM um, in the upcoming election. So uh, I think that time for that will come and we will get there. You know, let's talk about hurry dog, it rock on. We shouldn't be hurry. Let us take our time and, and do things decently and in order. Um, you raised the issue of, of um, let's see, well, the candidacies, I'm sorry. Uh, freedom of information, I think you've consistently raised that and we've pointed out that we would like to operationalize that um, this year. Uh, I look at my legal advisor because um, this is a conversation, it's an ongoing conversation. So I can give you no more than I've given you in the past to say that we hope to operationalize that this year. In relation to the integrity in public life, you didn't raise that one, but I'm very happy that all has been going in accordance to plan and that the commission has started its work as a matter of fact, I got a, a letter from them with a long form that they're telling me I need to fill out to give them all the details. So they're already doing their work. And I'm very pleased that we had a government who has delivered that uh, to the island of Nevis. We will be in the House shortly to make some amendments to that bill because we've had some concerns expressed about the, 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 the number, the, the width, the number of people who are covered. And so we are going to look at that carefully because I think the original bill had like directors of departments, et cetera, all the board members of statutory corporations, et cetera. So we're looking to see how we can cut that down a bit so that people do not feel put upon. As one person said to me, for the little money that they get as a board director for a statutory corporation, it's better if they quit rather than expose themselves to all of that. We also feel that the penalties for um, the commissioners or anybody in that office disclosing anybody's information that those penalties should be increased and they should have the harshest possible penalties to ensure 
that the confidentiality of information is preserved. So we have some work to do there. He didn't ask me that, but just reporting on that. Geothermal, I have seen a recent release from the, um, the, the company indicating that they have selected a company for the purposes of the drilling and all of that. They, they say that they are moving forward. I have always said on the issue of geothermal that I don't have a lot to say on it because I believe that they are to be the ones to advise in terms of where we are. We clearly have slipped badly in terms of timing on this particular project, but we continue to be hopeful that this project will come to fruition because if it does, it will be revolutionary for the island of Nevis. Paradise Beach Hotel, you said it's closed. I don't know where that comes from because that is not accurate. In fact, they're not only open, but they're doing very well. The last report suggests that they're full throughout the summer. So they're doing extremely well. It's one of the few properties on the island that is doing extremely well during the, the low season. Um, there was a case, as we all know, that was brought against the government, um, the planning department. I'm indicating that planning permission granted to Paradise Beach to build some five bungalows on the beach area, closer to the beach area, I'm sorry, that those bungalows should not have been built there. A judge in St. Kitts has given a decision saying that the bungalow should be demolished. The owners of Paradise Beach have said quite clearly that if they have to demolish those bungalows, the hotel will close. I am concerned, as I have to be, because I have nearly 70 people working down there, nearly 70 families that get a bread out of Paradise Beach. I'm also concerned because the hotel is doing extremely well and the contribution that they make into the revenue is important. It is one of the higher end properties on Nevis. It's a very luxurious property. And so naturally the government is concerned because we have never seen such a decision saying that something would have to be demolished. That decision, I'm advised, as of today, has been stayed by consent of the parties and a, 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 an application for permanent stay should happen sometime in September, later this month. And um, the stay basically will put a hold while the parties argue the matter on appeal. And uh, we will see what the appellate court has to say in relation to that. Um, I have had a lot of chatter about this particular project, but I think that in that chatter, let us remember that nearly 70 people work at this establishment. And those people are our brothers and our sisters and our neighbors. And those people are people who are earning an honest day's work honest days pay for an honest days work. And I think that that is important that we bear that in mind, that we're dealing with people's lives. People seem to see this as a political matter, that they can joust and say, oh, let Mark Brandley take that, let CCM take that. All that we have sought to do in this government is to generate development. And the same people who say, let us take that, are the same people who say, no investment coming to Nevis. That's the irony of ironies. Because investors come and they invest, and they create something, and not just create something, but something beautiful. It's one of the, the most amazing properties in the Federation, if not in the region at this point, Paradise Beach. And rather than us rallying around that, we start to denigrate and seek to destroy. To what end? Now, if tomorrow they were to close their doors, the same to bring as much relief as quickly as possible to them, and that is the result, that they will get the quickest possible payout. As I said, just to be clear, that the deadline that we've been given is by October 30th. But we are being told that most should be able to get their money within the first week of October. So I agree with you that in a normal course it takes a little while. But this was as a result of the proactive efforts by the minister, Minister Brand, and the cooperation of Minister Amory at the federal level that we are seeing an early payout for these workers and we feel that that's a good thing because we understand the trauma that they would have experienced by this closure, which was unexpected. <coughs> good morning again. Monique Washington, I think it's Nevis Observer newspaper. Um, going back to the Paradise Beach. In part of Justice Ventos' decision, he 
and quoting from that, he said, rather than administer the ordinance in the public interest of the people of Nevis, it seems that the public authority in this case, particularly the DPPR, the Director of Physical Planning, and the Cabinet were concerned mainly with the private interest of the intervening party. When these happen, the only persons who lose it, or the only person who lose are the people of Nevis who are, have entrusted those public authorities with the responsibility of facilitating an orderly coastal development which does not contribute to the beach erosion, thereby preserving the coastline for the next generation of Nevisions. With that said, Mr. Premier, does your cabinet take any responsibility for the situation that has happened down at Paradise Beach with the judge determining that those condos need to be knocked down? And is there any assurance that something like this will never happen again? I think you asked an excellent question. And let me put it this way. Judges are entitled to say whatever they want to say. That doesn't mean they're right. And it is not for me to gain say or second guess this judge. The judge is a bright fellow from all that I've read about him. And he must know what he's talking about. But let us not forget that's why we have a court of appeal. And that's why we have a privy council. We have them because the system appreciates that judges get it wrong because they're just like you and me. So I don't really get myself to caught up with the language that is used in any particular judgment until that judgment is final. And here, that judgment is on the appeal. So as eloquent as the piece might be that you have just quoted, it is at this point for me, neither here nor there, because it's under appeal. And we'll have to wait to see what the three wise people in the Court of Appeal have to say. And if they say one thing or the other, we'll go up to the cold climate in London to see what the lords and ladies up there have to say. So there's no magic to it. Judges make pronouncements. I've been a lawyer for a little while. And I can tell you, I have won some, I've lost some. And when you lose, you assess and you determine whether or not there's a ground for appeal. And that is how the system works. So I am not going to get it myself too caught up with what a judge has to say. The question of what happened at Paradise Beach is sub because it's before the Court of Appeal now. I will simply say this, that the government had before it a request for development. And the government took some decisions, and that development and that investment has happened. As a consequence of that development that's having happened, nearly 70 people, you know the people being Nevis people? They're working. They're getting a weekly, a monthly wage. They're supporting their families. They're sending their children to school. They're paying Nevlek and Water Department and buying the Observer newspaper every week. Those people are divisions too. And when we as a government sit down and we look to see how we can advance our island, we have to take into consideration all of the circumstances. People will say whatever they want to say. But I ask the question rhetorically. You have a piece of land right next to us here, covered in beautiful bush. It is as environmentally friendly and as natural as one could want. But what job does it create? What economic activity does it create? And if you have the whole island in that state, our people will have to migrate to St. Martin and St. Thomas and New York to find work. So as a government, we always have to strike a balance. We have to protect the environment. Yes, I will not resign from that. But our people cannot be expected to stay riding donkey. And some of those, and that is a problem I have, because nobody has yet paid attention to who is bringing these actions against the government. It's not Navy's people bringing these actions, you know. It's those who have come to save us. They've come to save us. But in their own countries, they got subway, taxi, highway. Subway meaning 
the rail and subway in terms of the restaurant too. They got McDonald's and KFC. They could decide whether they ride bike, motorbike, tram, train, car, Uber. All of this they have in their countries. But they come to Nevis and say to Nevis, you mustn't develop. And if your government seeks to develop, we're going to carry you to court. And they come here and they spend two weeks out of the year and then they go back where? To Paris and London and New York. Where they have their mansions and they have their highways and they have all of the modern amenities. But it is not for us. And we have to be concerned about that. Because Nevis cannot be kept in paralysis. In some time warp. Those same villas that were down at Paradise Beach. I challenge any of us. When next you're on the Southeast Peninsula. I see house they build with pilings in the sea. And a man come out to have a coffee in the morning. He's sitting on his porch and the ocean lapping under him. I don't hear noise being made. Right over there at Christopher Harbour. Go down to Park Hyatt. And as you come off the pier at Park Hyatt, there's a restaurant there. And people are there having breakfast. And the ocean is under you. Oh, it's such a wonderful song. Not a soul making a noise. I go down to Paradise Beach and I challenge you to go there today. The beach is the widest that it has ever been. Because this government partnered in doing some remedial work down there. But yet you are being told that a thriving entity bringing benefit to the island must knock down and shut down. Well, what is the government to do? What is the government to do? Who's the next target? Four Seasons? Nesbitt Plantation? And what bothers me is that this is not you or I who would bring in these things. These are people who jump on a plane and jet back to where they're from. We are but a holiday space for them. But you and I live here. You and I live here. We work here. And you have elected a government to serve you and to try to develop the island. We are not an irresponsible government. We have tried our very best. But when I start to hear people say, oh, they pull a measuring tape and this should be 50 feet and it's only 45 feet and knock it down. That to me can't. It doesn't sound logical to me. Because you and I know that if you pull the tape today, it's 45 and if you go back after a storm and you pull the tape, it's five. And you go back after the beach, come back and you pull the tape, it's 150. Because we who live here know the coastline comes and goes. That's the nature of, of nature. And there's nobody in my cabinet who seeks to violate our laws. What we're seeking to do in this cabinet is to seek to develop our island responsibly. I go over there in the St. James area, and every time I pass over there, I get upset because I see some buildings over there for this candy resort rotting away. About well, seven buildings out there rotting away. Now, a young man from university who come back here, a young lady could have been the manager over there. I'm sure they would have needed an accountant. Some people working in the kitchen, some people taking care of the grounds. All of that gone. Because somebody come and say that the EIA was not done properly. And I'm not suggesting that the arguments are not to be available to people. But we must sometimes examine why and who are making these arguments. Because there are people who are saying to you that you must ride donkey until you're dead because that's what they like to see. And they like to take pictures of you and go back to New York and sit in their condo and penthouse and show their friends and say, look at my friend, Monique on her donkey. <laughs> and we must be careful about what we are doing in this country because I don't believe people should come in here to dictate to the government how we should develop Nevis. That's the role of the electorate. When we go to an election, if you're not happy, you vote them out. Not for people who come to dictate to us. And so, my concern 
You see them 70 people who are working down at Paradise and their families? Those are who I am supporting because I understand what it must be like to be out of work. And that is what this government was supporting when it said that we would grant permission. Those types of construction, let us remember that it is wooden, therefore it's not a permanent structure, and it is elevated. In fact, I have seen, I haven't been able to go, but I have seen photos and videos of, I believe it's sandals, which has them actually in the ocean because they're designed to be built in the sea and connected by walkways. So that is, I believe, something that we must be cognizant of and we must bear in mind. And we must question sometimes the motivations of those who bring litigation in this country to stall development. And I have not ridden a donkey since I was about 10. And I didn't enjoy it then. And I don't want to go back to riding a donkey in Nevis. Matter of fact, if memory serves, I fell off the donkey. So I have no ambition to go back to that. And those who want to keep Nevis in the Stone Age, tell them not this government. We're not in that. So if there's another question, I will gladly take that question. No other questions, Mr. Hanley? <coughs> now that you mentioned our Candy Resort, uh, several months back I took a drive over there and I thought to myself those would make wonderful uh, apartment for students. So I'm wondering why, why are they just there rotting away? Can you give us some details? Well, they're there rotting away because an action was brought against the government by Ms. Ann Bass to say that the EIA and the planning, that planning errors were made. Let me put it broadly like that. And she got an injunction stopping the people from continuing with their construction. The court has since heard the case and the court has ruled in favor of the government. I think that is sometimes lost in the debate that the government has won the case. But Ms. Bass has appealed to the Court of Appeal. And in the interim, the injunction has been continued. So these investors have spent millions of dollars already. They have these units that are standing there, and the units are just rotting away because they can't do anything with them. So assuming the appeal is heard this year and a decision is made, there's a further level of appeal to the Privy Council. If that is heard next year or whenever, but by then, which investor is going to stick around? Investors are probably long gone. And what we have left is an eyesore over there when we could have had a thriving community generating employment, generating extra, whether it's rooms for students or, for that matter, for tourists. That has been lost to the island of Nevis because somebody come in and say the EIA was not the best EIA that you could do. Is that what we support? We have to make that decision as a people. Oh, can you also give us an update on <coughs> Nevis International Bank? I uh, drove up there the other day, and it's a beautiful, it looks like a palace up there in the hills, uh, nearing completion. Can you give us uh, some details, how many persons you think would be hired there, and when the, um, uh, the opening date scheduled for that? I, I uh, don't... I don't, Mr. Hanley, have the specifics, I confess. Uh, I didn't get any information before coming here. The last I was told that they plan to open this month, September, and I'm told that they have in place already their management team and uh, a considerable number of persons, including, I gather, some persons from Brownell Communications who have been able to find employment up there. Um, the last number I was told, but I admit that this was some months ago, that they thought that they would have uh, about 26 or thereabouts people um, employed when they open, including security and people like those. But I, I don't have any ready, accurate, and up-to-date information. And, you know, I'm always reluctant to speak unless I have that. But it is a significant investment that they would have made. Um, the numbers seem to be approaching somewhere close to 10 million US dollars. So in terms of a foreign direct investment, I think that is useful for the island. And it demonstrates again that despite the chatter to the contrary, the island and the government has been able to attract serious investors who have come and have spent money. 
So it is our hope that whenever they open, they will do well. They will employ people. In fact, I believe some people have already transitioned, some from government, some from the private sector in other financial houses, to them. And so I wish them all the best. And certainly when I have more information, I'll be delighted to share that with you. All right, thank you. One last question. Can you, in regards to candidates, can you declare at least if you will be a candidate? Well, I don't know. It depends on whether the party wants me. You don't know. Um, okay. You know, the, okay. the, the cupboard is so full in CCM, Mr. Hanley, that... Because, uh, so it might be three new candidates It might be. The, the cupboard party. is full. The cupboard is full. Three, we have so many options. Three new candidates coming. So many options. Oh well, you seem very sure preoccupied. <laughs> preoccupied with candidates, you know. I don't know why. You know? So, you, so Minister eh? Choi might be a candidate then. Minister <laughs> Choi would be an eminently qualified minister, candidate. Minister Hayes of Brandy as well. Eminently qualified again. Okay, thank you, know? you so much. But also we, we, we have other people. And, uh, look, look around. And Young Hanley unopposed. <laughs> unopposed. There's no need for no candidate out there. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hanley. All the best. All right, do we have any other questions? Mr. Washington, Mr. Observer? Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. It is now midday, so I am really grateful for the opportunity to have come and to have had an opportunity. And we will send out the next date for our next press conference, but I thank the members of the press, the members of the cabinet, obviously, the permanent secretaries who are here, but the members of the press mostly, because this is an effort that we make in terms of good governance, giving an opportunity for you to ask questions and hopefully providing some answers that make sense. Thank you. God bless you.